podcasting from Chico, California. This is the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast, where we discuss fly fishing, guiding, fishery science and management, conservation, and more. Know better. Fish better. Learn more at barbless.co. Here's your hosts, Chad Alderson and Nick Hanna. This episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast is brought to you by California Trout. Working throughout the state to ensure we have resilient wild fish thriving in healthy waters for a better California. Support Caltrout's innovative science-based work by becoming a member or donating today at caltrout.org. Hey everybody, welcome to another awesome episode of the Barbless Fly Fishing Podcast. You like how I threw that in there? Yeah, a little presumptuous, but no, <laughs> no pressure. No, no pressure. Uh, that's Chad, obviously. I'm, I'm Nick Hanna. And um, before I introduce our, our awesome guest today, um, I'd just like to share you know, our thoughts. We, you got Cal Trout now sponsoring us. And um, obviously, um, we'd love to have you guys just hit pause real quick and, and log on to their website and, and become a member. Um, for me as a father, it's a no brainer. You know, they, they do things for our fisheries you know, that, that no other company really does. Um, they bring a lot of resources together and, and, um, they're going to help create a better fishery for us and, and my kid down the road. So please, uh, please hit pause and, and jump on the Cal trout and become a member or make a donation. Um, definitely help out. So without further ado, um, I'd like to introduce our, our guest today, um, with whoosh innovations, uh, Vince Bryan. Hey Vince, how's it going? Hello everybody. Uh, it's going well. Thanks. The whoosh. Is that the salmon cannon guys? <laughs> that i hear so much about <laughs> it's a it's a pretty awesome name and, and vince I, I i know we're going to hear in detail about it but we had listeners that contacted us saying have you seen those guys throwing salmon into this tube and and basically shooting them out of a salmon cannon uh into the lake and and i know that the technology and what you guys have done has changed over time and um you have some uh, basically um ramps that you're now using and can you know actually section off a hatchery versus wild and invasive species and whatnot so i'm sure we're gonna hear more about that but um before we get into that uh, tell us a little bit about whoosh and and how you guys got started Uh, yeah uh you know we uh we actually got started in uh in ag uh, believe it or not uh in uh, we were trying to solve a totally different problem um but it was uh, involving uh gently moving fruit from an apple tree specifically uh, into a bin gently. And uh, that led to the core technology that we used. No to, pun intended. Ooh. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> uh, that that we used. Uh, um, we were actually down in California um, uh, in the citrus orchards down there. And we were, uh, had been in, uh, in the grove uh, one year and the next year we were back and the grove next door was completely dead. And we asked what, what happened. And, uh, uh, we had heard that the the water had been turned off for the uh, for the salmon, um, and uh, so that that uh, sort of uh, got us interested in the subject matter, um, and uh, and thought uh, we might have something that could help here, and uh, and it really just took off from there. Uh, so we've completely pivoted the company to focus on uh, fish passage. Um, and it's been a it's been a long road to get uh, to the point that we are at today. Yeah, salmon cannon. That's to me is something you know that uh, it was a step along the path here uh, in 2014. That was the first system that we we sold, um, and uh, the media dubbed it the salmon cannon. I, I like to call it the salmon cannon with just one end on the cannon part, uh, and uh, we're just you know it's it's we're talking about the truth here. Um, and <laughs> and so every every everything that we're we're really doing is uh, let's really understand the facts and the data and let's take the politics out of this and bring technology to bear to help with the problem. And that's really what we're about. Can you um, go back to where you guys did that pivot? Like what made you decide to, was it, was it literally just that there was the, the salmon, the dewatering event that were, it was caused by the salmon. And then is that, is that right? Is that, am I following you? Right. And then, what I well, guess? How did? What made you guys decide to pivot specifically to fish passage? You know, uh, it was a combination of things, uh, but, but that that certainly alerted us to uh, how real the problem was um, for uh, both for the fish, but also for uh, the uh, the ag, and uh, that obviously there was a conflict here, and our our. Uh, 
Uh, but for me, for me personally, um, f- uh, my passion has always been with fish and fishing and and outdoors and so forth. So to to me, it was uh, uh, it, it, my interest was drawn there anyway. Um, but uh, probably the the final piece of the puzzle of moving us to that pivot there was uh, uh, the best way to slow down the piece of fruit when it came through the tube was to. Um, to have it decelerate in into the water, and um, and uh, one of the one of the difficult problems that we were working on to overcome was getting the the first apple out of the way uh, for the next apple coming through, and uh, obviously you didn't have that problem with the fish. So uh, <laughs> as they would just swim um, swim away on their own, so we didn't have to worry about that. Uh, particular problem so it was uh you know it was it was it was the technology just it just worked so well it seemed um, like an easy transition yeah it, it yeah yeah now i uh, i think we probably underestimated the politics of of, <laughs> of of the issues and maybe the regulatory side of things but um we uh we, we weren't really intimidated by that element of it and that maybe that's my background i uh it's uh uh as trained in as in law and did a lot of licensing work and uh, and been involved in um, legislation and so forth. So to me, it was like, okay, uh, we can get through that. Um, though I, I think it's probably one of the more difficult things to have tried to to navigate. Um, at the end of the day, uh, we just saw there, nobody else is going to do this, um, and uh, it's it was sort of fell into uh, you know what is happening out there generally with climate change and the move to uh, renewables, we just didn't see that it was practical to think that uh, all the dams are going to come down um, and uh, the fish didn't have time for that to happen. Um, so, uh, you know, somebody's got to do this. And uh, we were in a particularly good uh, situation for from a perspective of um, of bringing the technology that we'd already developed on the ag side and, and to, to bear on this. Yeah. So I think the um you know what you said about it's not it's not reasonable to think that all the dams are going to come down. Um I think from my perspective it's it's kind of like how you classify a dam, uh the role of the dam in in the economic infrastructure or whatever it is. If it's to generate hydropower, I would maybe disagree with you because as you know solar comes more solar comes online, we just get better about storage, more efficiently moving electricity back and forth. Uh hydropower actually becomes more of a deficit operationally to, to run than it does to, you know, to just pull it down. We're actually seeing this starting to happen in Northern California and, and the, you know, the, the surrounding areas. Um, but there's also the dam that has hydropower, but also the main thing there is, is obviously f- flood control or just, you know, wa- reservoir storage. And that would be mm-hmm. like Shasta or, or, um, Oroville, Oroville. Right. So, yeah. Um, I just want to make that point, but I'm I'm following you so far. <laughs> well, and I, I'll just I I understand uh, the point that you're making, but we've had to become um, much more expert in the hydropower side of things than maybe I thought we would ever need to be uh, to understand what's uh, happening here. And and with wind and solar, uh, the reason that the uh, Department of Energy has uh, been quite supportive of what we're doing here is that it, as wind and solar grow. Um, uh, you really, as you know, need that base load of mm-hmm. that hydropower provides, and the other options today uh, at scale are are not necessarily attractive. They're the carbon um, <laughs> solutions or nuclear um, are are really those uh, options. And uh, you know, f- what is it? Uh, Forty countries in the world have fifty percent or more of their power coming from hydropower. So we're not looking at this as just you know. Uh, in, in any in, in any particular area, there there's different solutions that may be uh, better, but a lot of the a lot of the world is um, is operating on hydropower. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, it for and uh, what it, it, there's nothing more distressing to know that we could put a system in in three months and have fish passing over the dam and um, everybody to be arguing about it for 10 years as the fish <laughs> dwindle every year. Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, so, a super valid so, point. Um, what can you kind of, for the folks that don't know um, what the heck we're talking about, I just realized yeah. we, we didn't really, we just kind of assume everybody knows what well, we're talking about. Can you kind of like explain visually 
what this thing does like you well, know. and then start with that that first project that you you set up in 2014 yeah. your first client maybe use that as a an example yeah sure um so from a development standpoint um well one of the things that we learned in ag uh, was it was really hard to do development when you only had a harvest once a year because if you then made a change you had to wait a whole year to right. test it test it again so um so what we decided to do is we had to go to a place where we had fish year round and we went to Norway and we started with dead fish um, for obvious reasons um, in the processing plants to let's get the let's get the transport technology down. That that really taught us a lot about um, durability and um, what we were going to have to do there um, in uh, various harsh conditions in Norway. Um, uh, but we had dead fish, so it didn't it, that didn't. Uh, it didn't matter if we made a mistake early on um, with the fish. Um, we went from that to aquaculture operations and, and in the United States, hatchery operations. So the project that you're talking about is uh, the first system that we sold to uh, WDFW, Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife, it was on the Washougal River with um, a Thule a Chinook salmon. Uh, and the uh, state of Washington had been put under court order to separate uh, wild salmon uh, that were coming up the Washougal River from the hatchery mm -hmm. salmon that were coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, the hatchery was 14 miles upstream and they were uh, they were uh, using the, the grounds uh, spawning areas below the hatchery. So they set up a weir um, below 14 miles downstream and they had a uh, they were trying to remove those fish, had to get them up the embankment up into their hatchery truck to take them to the hatchery. And uh, so that initial system was, and you've, you've seen a lot of video about that because uh, it, it went viral back then too, um, but it was where they had uh, trapped the fish in, a, in, a, in the trap. And they still do this um, today. I, they've been doing it continuously every year. Um, the fish come in to the trap once a or twice a day, depending on the number of fish, they open up the trap. A couple of uh, WDFW folks get in there. They look at the, the fish, determine whether it's a wild or hatchery based on the adipose fin being present or not. And then um, the hatchery fish are uh, whooshed, um, loaded in, as you said, uh, into the uh, uh, accelerator or the the salmon cannon as everybody wants to call it and then it, they're moved up about up the embankment about 120 feet into the hatchery truck and uh, and it just saved them a huge amount of time um before they were taking a tote um that was filled with water and they had a big loader that they would drive down the embankment of the into the stream um the river there and uh and the fish are trashing around they get about 25 fish in in the tote then they try to dump it into the truck most of the fish would make it it was just uh, <laughs> uh it was just a, a a very laborious uh for the people but also for the the fish it was a bad experience sure um so uh that that was that was the first system um that we used with uh if you will uh wild and uh, fish in, in the wild. <laughs> um, and, uh, but it was obvious even at that point that, um, all this handling that was taking place was, was not a solution to the, the bigger problem, which was a really fish passage over barriers and so forth. We just had to get through the regulatory part of this, that it, that this was, um, uh, safe, uh, the transport part before we were able to put the resources and get the investors to, uh, commit to uh, putting in the dollars to develop these uh, sorting uh, algorithms to it and so forth. Um, and uh, so that that's what uh, we had phase one and then phase two uh, was this whole sorting thing. So where we are today is we've put it all together um, and uh, just uh, just had a big uh, demonstration at Chief Joseph Dam uh, this week um, on Tuesday of this week where uh, the fish have been blocked on the Columbia River since 1938, and there's a plan by the Northwest Power Conservation Council that's several years long to reintroduce fish in the upper Columbia. So this was a technical um, demonstration in a very large body of water, uh, and uh, uh, so 
so it's it's uh, from from our standpoint, it's the culmination of all the work that we've been doing. We've had other other deployments. Um, this was uh, uh, on uh, installed on a thirty foot by sixty foot barge system. So we were literally able to move it into position once we got the permit, which um, to, uh, happened in record time, but still took six months. Six months. It um, does sound like but, record time. Yeah. It's light speed. <laughs> Yeah, we uh, we had it on a barge though, so we were able to avoid a lot of the um, uh, normal infrastructure type permitting re- required. Um, we weren't leaving any kind of footprint, and we were able to move the barge into place. And within ten days, we had the system up and running. Damn. So, so it's it's now normally we want. Uh, <laughs> 90 days or more. We just didn't have that much time, so we were doing a lot of work, uh, um, sort of offsite, uh, so that uh, once we got the permission, it was really just putting the system onto the onto the barge and then moving the barge upriver. So uh, that's the you know. But from our standpoint, hey, we I got 85,000 dams in this country. Um, I've got it. We've got to do be able to do 11 a day um, to to get all fish passage in in uh, all 85,000 dams in, in 20 years. So, so we have, have to figure out how to make this modular, how to, how, how to deploy it quickly, how do we um, not um, have to deal with some of the um, land use uh, permitting uh, requirements that, uh, uh, that are out there. And in many t- places, it's difficult. You've got multiple jurisdictions um, in a, in the in a concentrated area that you're having to work through and we, we can't avoid all of that uh, nor should we but uh at the same time uh the system is, lends itself to um uh, any an easy environmental footprint um so uh okay so my my takeaway and all that um and and i'm talking you know basically hardware specific stuff um there, mm-hmm. there's two major components to it and it was a phased project so the first phase was like basically um you know the passage itself like conveyance of the fish up up river right right um with respect to that like how how um i guess soft on the fish is 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 it like are they losing scales or you know like how how bad does the fish get beat up if at all yeah well we wouldn't have uh <laughs> that was the question we had to first answer back in yeah. um in 2011 uh, is when we did the study with USGS on that particular um, question. Um, we had already done it internally and decided that it, it was safe. Uh, we had done a fluorescein uh, study with uh, trout um, in our uh, facility where you uh, the, 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 the fish is, uh, after it goes through, if you put uh, fluorescein on and then put the fluorescein under a black light and so forth if there was damage it would sort of jump out at you as a as a uh, uh, injury we didn't see anything even even uh, it would show up as a for example a scratch on the cornea of the eye that we, we saw nothing saw no no lost scales and so forth i know exactly uh, what you're was, talking about my dog just scratched his cornea and they had to put this green dye in there to highlight where the yeah. where it was is that the same stuff same stuff yeah oh, exactly okay, okay yeah, cool yeah yeah yeah, so so um, we had done that internally. Um, we then did an independent study with the uh, USGS out of the um, their uh, Columbia River office down near Portland, uh, and they came back at the, and uh, they said, "Well, uh, this is a published peer-reviewed article that we have on our website." Uh, but, but basically, said, said uh, "No, this uh, appears to be no harm to the fish." Here, but they did come back with a recommendation to us, uh, and basically say, "But we, <laughs> but we, uh, we need to redo the tube." Which it was at that point still pretty much our what we call our ag tube, the one that we were using for the mm-hmm. apples. And they said, "You know, we need to redo this because it's not going to be durable enough." And so a lot of our time was spent on that issue: how do we make this durable um, and and uh, still protect the fish as they're traveling and, through it? Yeah, exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. And so. Go ahead. I forgot what I was going to say, which is actually pretty rare. It <laughs> happens three. Th- it's happened three times so far in a hundred episodes. <laughs> oh, is, oh, I'll get it. It'll come back to me. Go ahead, Nick. You had something. Well, I, I was. 
go ahead. No, I was just going to say that, the, you know, in, in history, you got fish oh. ladders, fish lifts, helicopters. I mean, you're talking about, uh, I've, and I've seen it firsthand, you know, um, here locally, we have um, a small stream that has the last one of the last runs of spring run salmon um, that, that come into our valley. And I've seen those salmon just fly up onto the grates of a fish ladder and flop around back and forth, bam, 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 you know, almost beat themselves to death. Then get back in the water and then, you know, work their la- way up through that ladder. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, when I first saw this system, I was like, man, this is, this seems awesome. You know, like yeah. this is just going to eliminate a lot of that, you know, the fish already has to go through so much hardships to, to get to where it needs to be. You know, if we can help it in some small way, I mean, why not, you know, like why, why yeah. not implement something like this? I, I do remember my question now. Okay. So with respect to the peer reviewed article that you mentioned, and then the study that was done mm-hmm. on, on, uh, whether or not the, the, the method was harming them, um, was there, was there kind of like a control group set up? And what I mean by that is maybe it's like, you know, yeah. 10 people doing it the old school way with their hands doing the system like they would normally do it. Did you guys use that as kind of a delta, you know, a data point just to kind of do a delta? Well, n- n- not on that study. That that's stu- uh, We've done 20 studies since, uh, okay. or there's been 20 studies done since that are all independent yeah. studies. But th- that first one was really, um, as I said, it was um, based on observation uh, using the fluorescene they were doing. Uh, they did blood samples, I think, to measure the stress, and 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 so they've they had comparables to other studies that had been done. They so they would know um, in previous years, um, you know, whether this was falling outside uh, a normal uh, realm or not. But but basically, it, it, there wasn't a control group within that particular study. Usually, in subsequent studies that we did, yes, there was there was a ladder control group or a trap and halt control group or um, uh, something along those lines. And in fact, we ha- we've we insisted at times um, that, that, that the study not be done without that control group um, there, because uh, uh, f- first of all, we're, 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 we're completely confident that we're going to be as good or better than what the, whatever control group you give me. Um, uh, and we just know that, that that's the case. Uh, so from our standpoint, uh, we only have, um, you know, something to lose by not having a control group there. Right. And if, and in fact, if we were showed up, um, that we were worse, uh, then, then we have a problem that we need to address. It would, it would tell us, um, you know, that we've got to be doing better than what we're doing. So, so, um, we're, <laughs> We're really interested in solving the problem, um, and we can't do that without. Uh, I'll go back to that salmon cannon thing. I mean, it's it's really C A N O N. It's it's really let's let's deal with the facts here, and then we can deal with the problem. If we if we're not really dealing with the facts, um, then we're really not ever going to solve the problem. So um, that has been our approach throughout, um, and. Uh, uh, you know that's that that too has proven to be a challenge for us because as we've made improvements and changes uh, to make things better or to um, to add features to our system, uh, we're constantly having to reprove that the system is is uh, better. <laughs> yeah, so I get the sense that you guys that you got Woosh doesn't like the name Salmon Cannon because it it conjures up some you know combustible kinds of visions of a fish being catapulted maybe like a circus clown into a net or something. Yeah. Well, you know, we love it. Every, we love it just like everybody else does it from that perspective, but it, it is, you know, our DNA, um, if you will, as a company was how to move fruit gently. So, you, and if you right. take a piece, you know, if you take an apple and drop it from one inch high onto a hard surface, it bruises. So, you know, it really, um, it, it yeah, it hurts. So when people think that and a, a lot of the images that you see, uh, that you've seen, um, that have been uh, combined with, uh, you know, other other videos that uh, people are making and so forth, um, it it it's uh, it's not where we're at uh, so far as the uh, uh, you know you you might have seen, taken this from a study that was done you know eight years ago and that piece of the video keeps showing up today, so. Uh, it, it's, uh, it's a little odd. Um, 
And, you know, part of it is that when we have a fish, from because from today, from the fish's perspective, they swim in, they slide, and they glide. That's 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 the fish's experience. Um, it's like going to a water slide, park. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. But uh, let's, uh, uh, I, I like to say, you know, it's, uh, it's the equivalent for the fish of a skyscraper taking, taking the elevator rather than asking him to take the stairs up. Um, it's, it's the same kind of experience, uh, for the fish here. It's, it's really easy. And, uh, so they come in, um, when they're sliding there, we're just taking pictures of them, 18 pictures of every fish that comes through. Right. Um, and then we're making that, uh, instantaneous decision with the computer as to what to do with that fish. And then they're gliding through the tube. So, so it's a, um, and they don't come flying through the air like you'll, you're seeing. We, we could make them go flying through the air. That's possible. But maybe but the, maybe but, every tenth one just for the cameras. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but but you know, r- really, what's much what's what much cooler is the, when you look at the shots where the where we've got the camera under the water and the fish comes out of the tube and then they just swim away. And we have um, uh, examples of that. Um, the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife, for example, we were working on the Salmon River, and they had, um, at their hatchery operation there, they had been uh, sorting the fish too, and, and the wild fish were going back to the river, and they were sending them down a PVC pipe that was just sort of gravity-fed for 200 feet or something, and so yeah. the fish would be flopping around as they're going through the pipe to get down there. And they said, they they told us um, about half of their fish would, as they ent- re-entered the water there, would be floating upside down some of them would recover some of them wouldn't um and uh we set up the whoosh system uh and they every one of the fish uh just swam away and yeah, uh, so they schooled up and went that actually gets to my one another question i've got so um is there a max length or a that was my vertical question, next question grade well, like right? max maximum grade uphill grade or, or what are the constraints and physical distance. constraints and all that stuff can you talk about um I think minimums are not in, in too important, but maximums, you know, could you, could you yep. put them, could you get them up over Lake, Lake Shasta, for example? Yep. <laughs> uh, so, so the one we just did at Chief Joseph Dam, um, the, uh, the dam itself is a, about 230 feet high. Um, and uh, uh, so just to give you an example, uh, there, the, the uh, longest system we've done is so far as 1700 feet long. Um, and a, uh, a system that's 1100 feet long, um, we typically don't want to go more than 40 degrees. That's not because we can't go more than 40 degrees. It just limits the, uh, size range of a fish of the fish that can go in any particular tube. So I, we can go completely vertical straight up. Um, but, but then I have to have many more tubes, um, in order to, to get the full range of fish that we might encounter, there. So typically if we go at a 40 degree, uh, range, we, uh, we, we get a pretty big range, um, uh, within any one tube of a size of fish. So, uh, if we're talking, uh, okay. salmon 15 to 35 pounds could fit in a single tube. Okay. Um, all right. So another question, um, you know how like electricity gets p- pushed over a line from A to B, right? You start out with X amount of power and, and, you come out with slightly less than than went in because they yep. it just naturally bleeds energy basically. Yep. Um, do you guys get the same sort of a kind of a phenomenon with dissolved oxygen content at you know origin versus destination or the or the the uh, do levels different? I thought you were going to go completely different direction um, with that question. So I'm, I'm going to answer both, okay. <laughs> but, but uh, I would like to know what uh, you thought I was going to say after this though. Yeah. I, uh, so I, I, I will let you know. Uh, so where I, uh, in the tube, we, it is not a, um, it, the tube itself is not filled with water. Oh, so, so when the fish is being transported through the water, if, if it were, we would be limited by physics um, and, and the pressure we'd have to create in the tube, we would not be able to go up any height. Okay. That, ex- so, yeah, the four, I was like 40 degrees. Wow. That's like a lot of water, a lot of weight, but the key is there is no water in it. Okay. So I, I'm just moving a fish except yeah. that what we do for the fish, and this is, um, it's, it's, it's simple, but it's, um, 
it's delightful for the fish. Um, the, every um, every six feet within the tube, we have a mist coming down um, in the tube itself. Okay. So that 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 does a couple things. It um, keeps the tube lubricated on the inside, so that's good. Um, but it also, in the studies that have shown um, that the fish are not stressed in the tube, they're clearly exchanging oxygen um, as they go through the tube. So that's why they're not stressed um, uh, as they come out the other end of the tube. They're they're breathing the whole time, but, but they're moving very quickly with without using any energy. Um, what are they doing feet per second? Just it's like twenty miles yeah, an hour. T- 20, 25 feet per second. Yeah, which is close to twenty miles really per fast. hour. Really fast. Okay. Yeah. And, and that's the under the regulations uh, from National Marine Fishery Service. That's the fastest uh, uh, that a fish is supposed to re-enter the water. So in a trap and haul operation, can you imagine the they, testing that went into that to come up with that rule? <laughs> <laughs> a lot yeah. of fish died for that study. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you it, it, you know the fish is always trying to go upstream. So if in, if they were right. in a trap and haul and they were emptying a truck out and it was going down a, a slide down into the water. Um, you can imagine the fish would accelerate pretty fast as they were going down the slide, but yeah, the like, fish is facing the wrong direction. And so, uh, so the, the, the risk for those fish is that they're, they catch their gill plate as they reenter the water right, and it tears, or tears right. their gill plate. That's, that can't really happen in our system. The fish will be, will be going head first. Um, but we're complying with that regulation. So, um, in, in that very long tube, I mentioned the 1700 foot long tube, um, and this is where I thought you were going is, uh, with the, fr- there is a, although it's almost frictionless over that distance, um, uh, there, there is a reduction in the uh, pressure effect, if you will, over, over distance. And so, um, we, uh, at the, at the 1100 foot, um, mark, uh, were basically had a booster pump in, in, in the system. Um, and it was designed in such a way that we didn't have to have a gate or anything. It was just a continuous tube, but we were actually able to drain off the, the, the pressure that we had originally put into the system, which was about one PSI, and then reintroduce it behind the fish again to keep it uh, moving quickly. So there we were actually moving faster than 25 feet per second. And then we, um, towards the end, we bled the bled the air out of the system so the fish would slow down to the com- to the required speed before it re-enters the water. So you're, are you basically like creating a negative vacuum in front of the fish? And it's getting yeah, pulled we're, through? We're, 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 we are creating a pressure differential. That's uh, right. Yeah. It's, it's, okay. it's, and, uh, and the reason I, I make that distinction is if, if we were just sucking and the tube is flexible and soft um, and uh, in a long tube – it would be like a straw and it would collapse the tube yeah, right, in, in, right. in front of it. So what we're actually doing is um, when, it, when the fish enters, depending on the system and what we need to do, uh, sometimes we are pulling the fish in, um, but that only occurs for a few feet. And then we, we actually reverse it and we, um, pu- we're pu- literally pushing the fish um, from behind, increasing the pressure behind the fish. So, We'll make it uh, 15 psi in front of the in behind the fish, and atmospheric pressure is 14 psi. So it, it is effect uh, the it is both uh, being pulled and pushed. I mean, you're because it, it, um, physics it's going to go to the lower pressure. So so it's but but it's not such a difference that it will collapse the tube, and we have a bigger pressure behind it, so that's opening, making sure that the tube stays open. It's a, it's a, it, it's a simple concept. And what's really neat if you think about it too, is that you can have multiple fish in a tube. Um, and the, the fish that is moving in front of the, the next fish that's coming as it's pulling and it's, um, it's actually creating a, grabbing it kind of, yeah, yeah, it's, it's creating a pressure differential there too. So Mm -hmm. it's actually then sucking it, if you will, um, behind it. So, you can have multiple fish within the same tube and, and have them move right along. That kind of leads to one of my questions. How many, how many fish compared to like a fish ladder can you move throughout the system in the same period of time? Yeah. Right. Well, there's lots of different fish ladder sizes. So, uh, right. right. <laughs> um, the, the, 
uh, uh, the longer our tubes are, the 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 capacity uh, will go down because we're having to move. There is a limit on the number of fish I can have in any one tube at any one time. So. Um, our standard um, sort of answer to this question is that uh, uh, right now, our, the, the thing that is limiting us is the sorting algorithm. Um, and so we can do uh, 40 uh, fish per minute. Um, and uh, that's just takes, that's how long it takes us to make do the calculations. Um, so uh, that we're assuring that the fish gets into the right tube. That's, that's about 57,000 fish over a 24 hour period. Can you um, let's talk about the sorting technology for a minute? Um, Cause that's, I think that that was really the breakthrough for you guys, right? Once you got the, the conveyance part down, um, can you kind of like explain how that works? We, some of us are technical um, that listen. Yeah. <laughs> um, sure. L- just, you know, more details better than no detail. Really like to know. I mean, I'll sign an NDA if you'd like. I'm kidding, but um, yeah, just kind of talk about the, the your sorting technology from you know the hardware if it's you're using vision systems and all the way up to the software stack. Yep. Okay. Uh, well, I, I, again, so our we you know remember we started out in fruit, um, and mm-hmm. so in packing houses they've been sorting forever, and um, on the harvesting system that we were working on. Um, uh, prior to the fish, we also had a scanning system there, and we 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 would sort on size, color, and defects. And if you think about it, it's not much different for for the fish. You just have to label it a little right. differently. So si- size for us is still s- circumference. Um, we, we need to know that, but we uh, we can we measure the length as well. But the important part for us is, to get it in the right tube is the cir- circumference. It's just like a just like an apple, <laughs> um, and then um, the uh, and, uh, size, get... co- co- yeah, color. Color is in fruit would be the same. Think of that as in speciation. If we can identify the the color spectrum within a fish, then we can uh, identify the species. And then the third element was defects in fruit. For fish, that would be um, think of that as the adipose fin. Is it there or not? Uh, or uh, has it been clipped or not um, from the perspective of identifying a wild versus a hatchery fish. So the, uh, it was a matter of taking that core um, engine, if you will. And, and a lot of the hard part of this was we now had this element of water um, as the fish is coming out of the water um, before they enter the tube. We had to dewater enough that we could get a perfectly clear image that wasn't uh, so that there was no turbidity effect and and so forth so that we would uh, consistent have a consistent environment from a from the picture standpoint um, so so from a development standpoint what we do is we need about a thousand images of a particular species and then we can actually use um, artificial intelligence and and th- th- this has moved so quickly in the last few years that we thought this was going to take forever and now it's just now we just don't think so it's it's, it's we just need a thousand images um, yeah are you guys using and, like Google machine learning or or so, like what Amazon's got or what Microsoft's got can you talk about that a bit uh, we are not using either of their um of theirs um we are using a, a, a proprietary uh uh a system that i'm not going to disclose uh here but but uh but fundamentally the ideas are the same um right uh, and it's it's working it's working in the same manner uh for us we're you know we're we're modifying this to work particularly well with uh you know, for the kind of work that we're doing, but, uh, uh, so yeah, so it's not, it's not, f- the concept isn't foreign. What, what was really the hard part of this whole thing. And the reason I think fish have not, um, ha- have not been the focus here, what, you know, the water that the fish are usually imaged in is, uh, is, is, is really a hard medium to work with because it's, right. it's, doesn't give you a consistent background and so the background separation becomes this gigantic uh problem that you're trying to overcome all the time and uh that's what we that's what we had to work so hard to are, overcome so well. are you guys using like um or you're using infrared sonar and 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 then images and and 
all all three of those layers or something some mix of those we're, to kind of figure this out we're not we're not using sonar but we okay. we do use infrared and and the right. um uh, optical um both uh and uh like throwing so ir dots then at the at the subject uh kind of like when you unlock your phone your iphone with your face on iphone 10 you know that front facing <laughs> well, I'm, a, I'm on android so, so oh, i'm sorry but, uh, <laughs> uh the um it, it, it it's 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 we just have an infrared camera that's um you know right alongside uh an a uh, high definition 4K optical camera that's imaging okay. the fish, and and uh, so so those two images are paired, um, and we're taking them from multiple angles. So uh, because the fish isn't going to come through consistently, it's 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 going to be doing something, um, and we're we're so there's actually 18 images taken, total nine of each type of infrared and and of each um, fish. Of each fish. Okay. Yeah. And, and so, so that's why you can only do 40 in a minute then. It's not really yeah. the computational bottleneck. It's really literally just capturing the, the optics and, and whatever else is needed for the computational stuff. Is that right? That, that's, that, yeah. It's, uh, yeah. It's, it's, we're having to look through 18 images, making sure amongst those 18 images that we're in agreement, some of them get thrown out because they're, um, they're not good. <laughs> and this is and, all happening so, in the, in the computer. It's all happening in the computer. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so basically, with it, less than half a second from the time the fish enters the system, um, it, it, it we've selected which tube the fish can go into. Uh, okay. It goes into. So, so I got one more software question, and then I want to switch to hardware because <laughs> that's really that sounds pretty cool too. Um, so, you guys, so you have a proprietary machine learning algorithm. Uh, is it? Is it on site? Is it running in in hardware that's like located on site, or is this up in the cloud? Um, so, uh, the the re, the root of the question is: Do yeah? Do, it's an, I, infa- I it's an infrastructure <laughs> question. Yeah, yeah. Um, we most of we are not running it in the cloud because most of the places that we're at um, have terrible. Uh, right that's what i figured so okay <laughs> so, so, so that's why you can't so, use machine any anything from google or microsoft or whatever else you guys have this constraint the data constraint but data access constraints so you got to build yeah. bring it to the you have to bring the whole party with you essentially yeah, that, that, that's right um and 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 uh it's not as bad as it seems uh so so um but it uh it will get better i think over time as uh you know, 5G comes out and other things that are going to enable high, um, uh, high data. Uh, every one of these images is like, uh, it's huge. <laughs> so, well, I don't, did so, you, if you guys so, watch the Apple keynote this week, um, the, the new iPhone, whatever pro that they have, um, obviously the camera is what everybody's excited about, but on board, they now have a, basically a machine learning optimized processor that's on the, on the, uh, device. That might be something that you guys could leverage, hmm. you know, hmm. it, maybe let your okay. engineers know. Yeah, I, I will for sure. Because I can see have, that running, you know, you could run, possibly run that whole thing, just port it to an iPad or something, right? And run it there. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Yeah, it, it's, uh, you, you know, I think this is just going to get better and better as Absolutely. the technology and it's moving pretty fast. So, um, uh, the the key for us uh, was really getting how do we get the image that we really need to have here and know that we're getting that image and uh, yeah. that was because we had subjects that didn't uh, individuals that didn't you know necessarily agree that with uh, w- the, the what we were trying to do which is take their picture they wouldn't just look at the camera and say cheese you no, know I know I have a dog uh, <laughs> I can't get him to take a freaking photo for the life of me so I can imagine a salmon's got to be tougher. <laughs> yeah um but but for example the great lakes fisheries commission i mean um this is we're, it's not i don't want to limit us to, to salmon because that's not all that we've been doing here um the great lakes fisheries commission has had one of our scanning systems um uh in the great lakes that they've imaged now i think uh for uh, about a thousand images of 14 different species um and um and that gives us the base from which to 
um, to, to work from for classification and so forth. Is this for steelhead? That. Is that what their, their purpose is mainly? Um, well, no. Um, <laughs> so th- it, it depends on where you are exactly, but they, uh, the sea lamprey is a big problem there. So, um, years ago now, the army Corps built, uh, 3,400 barriers, um, in the tributaries around the great lakes and so forth to prevent the sea lamprey from going up, um, and have blocked all other fish as well. And so this is really about returning fish passage, but, um, to those fish, um, the native fish, like a walleye, for example, and not allowing, um, some of these invasives, um, like the sea lamprey to, to move upstream and, and further South it's, it's, uh, the you know the Asian carp this right 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 and, right and so is forth. that so, data set public? Uh, no, I mean we're, right now we're just we're just collecting the images um, and uh, uh, so no is the answer to that. Right. Um, I think I think uh, the classification um, piece of that um, th- there's going to be some um, public uh, disclosure of that when that's done, but. Uh, uh, I, I, you know, I, I can't remember the specifics of yeah, that well no enough to, to speak well, more let's, on it. Let's talk about the, the sorting really quick. So I imagine there's at least two tubes to put these fish in classed by size, I assume. That that's the that's always the we have to have that size, and it's and, and is there anything else beyond that that we're doing? But yes, um, yeah. most of the time um, we need at least two tubes. Um, in a lot of rivers, it's it's it, it it's it's at least three, um, but uh, um, occasionally we're in places where one tube works. Um, you know, they have a specific run. Uh, pink salmon tend to all be in a similar size range, and so you can. Uh, we always have a bypass. I think that that exists no matter what. Um, so, if a fish came through and the scanner either couldn't identify the fish or didn't get the image that it needed to size the fish properly. Uh, what would happen is the fish would would just be uh, it would go right back into the water. Um, it, we wouldn't direct it into one of the tubes. So the default is bypass. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we we took a picture of them, they go back in the water. That was one of my questions and concerns because you're talking about you know a lot of the Chinook salmon, for example. Some get up to sixty five pounds. You know they, there are some really big Chinook salmon out there, and then obviously the yeah. small jacks that are involved. So and those are genetics, right? That we want to continue to, 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 yeah. get, to be in our environment. So uh, that was just one of my, is that a pushback that you get a lot or? No, I, I, I mean, to me, it's just, what's the size range of the fish that we expect in this river. Right. Then we have to put the, the appropriate, tu- yeah, yeah, we put the appropriate size tubes on that system. Um, oh. and, uh, it, but if we were to be surprised, <laughs> um, you know, that, that, uh, by, or there's a giant, uh, they said the biggest fish is going to be 40 pounds in this river and we get a 60 pounder. Um, and, uh, th- then what the, uh, scanner is going to go is, nope, that's not going to go. And we're just going to put it back in the water. Right. Um, mm-hmm. it's just going to slide right back in. Um, okay. So I, I got a couple questions around, you know, from the perspective, you know, concerns basically from the perspective of say, uh, fish passage engineers or biologists or conservationists. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, what, so when um, when when you guys talk to you know your traditional fish passage engineer in in like California Washington Oregon for example where some of you know some of the uh, these these dams are starting to come down, um, what is their take on what you guys are doing? Um, and I, I think also the conservation I can see a conservation angle there too, right? Like if if um, there's a dam that is is got some inertia to be pulled down and all of a sudden you guys come in with this technology making the uh you know this this project questionable in terms or or maybe solvable by another mean um there's that's the short term solve right but then there's the long term you know if the dam was down um you know all the downstream ecological benefits of having that dam down are, are pretty obvious um, how do you guys, um, answer questions that come up like that? Like what are your, what's your, what's your stance? You well, know, you know, you, the, the, do you understand the, what I'm yeah, asking? I, okay. Oh, I, oh, I understand totally what you're asking. Okay. And, and this is, this is the politics of the, the fish, uh, that are, that exist everywhere here. Um, you know, 
the the most direct answer is we try to stay out of that debate the best that we can, um, but we're often drawn into it. We we just said, look, we're from the fish's perspective, they don't they they would like to get up, and you are you you when when do you want them to get up? I mean, that's the that's the question. <laughs> do you want it to be sooner or later? Um, and um, so there's a certain uncertainty in any uh, taking down any dam as to when that might actually happen. And so our answer to that is then, well, why don't you put this in in the interim? And at least then you're, what you're doing is now you're reintroducing them up above. It may be years before it comes down. Um, at least they're uh, reestablishing them, themselves. You're, you're, you're doing a lot for the water and the, the, you know, the other environmental um, uh, factors that go into a successful reintroduction. Um, and yeah, so that's a, that's so, a really good point. Um, I think so, as long as there's a time constraint around the installation, I think, you know, that's, I think something that could be dealt with, you know, uh, it, I'm not following you. Well, it, if there's a time constraint around, uh, your, your guys's engagement with that particular project, right. Is if it oh. is indeed framed as a stopgap until the actual project comes to completion, why not, you know, help the, the, the volitional passage happen in the meantime, that would be pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's the right answer in all, in many situations. There's there's others that, um, you know, we've been uh, working very hard uh, to, to understand that in many situations that the dam isn't or can't come down. It just it, it just can't. Yeah, um, and- you know, you you you've got one of those situations there at Potter Valley um, down there that's been it's the Eel River. Everybody, yeah, uh, you know, th- to us this is such an obvious thing. We should, <laughs> we should be in there moving fish next year, um, uh, as an example. And um, for a fraction of the cost that was being talked about with the ladders when they were when uh, before BG <laughs> walked away from the whole thing and said, uh, "Forget it." Um, the 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 the, you know, the the reality of it is, uh, from our perspective, just looking at. And and trying to be fair to everybody's side, uh, the, um, here is uh, this this is unlikely to get resolved in a way that isn't diverting some water. <laughs> um, and uh, what the thing that we can offer here is we're not we're not going to need the, uh, water to to move the fish upstream. And so so if you can if you can. Uh, if you can use that, and I, I, this is here's a new thought for everybody in the fish passage area. And this is uh, in many places where there is a ladder today. I, I, w- I would argue that uh, it's much better for the fish to go through the woosh system. But but the other part of that element is um, I really see hydropower in many of these non-power dams because there's only 2,500 hydropower dams, and the rest are other. Uh, and um, but hydropower dams that have the money to do anything about fish passage. And so if you, if you want to have fish passage at these non-power dams today, um, one way of doing it would be to allow for enough hydropower to be um, produced that it actually pays for fish passage. Um, and, and so it can be a small, it can be small hydro, um, if you will, that way. Um, and you accomplish both in a, in a dam that is not otherwise going to come down. Um, so it, it's, the, the, I, I think, that, I think we have to, there needs to be another, another way. It, it, I, in many instances, it can't just be take the dam down or leave it up. It so needs to be, there needs to be another option. Just so I'm clear. You're saying yeah. that you could use a whoosh system to subsidize a non hydro powered dam, convert it to hydro and, and use a whoosh system to pay for it. Is that what you're saying? I, I am in, in, I didn't quite say it that way, but uh, I wasn't trying to quite say it that way. Let me use a more concrete example. If, if first of all, I use one where there is a ladder today. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, up, up to 10% of that water is going down that ladder. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and so that is, 
uh, potential revenue for fish passage is what I'm saying. If you don't, if, if that water can now be used through the hydropower plant, but we still get the fish up. Um, so the, the part of the problem from my perspective that, uh, why there isn't better and more fish passage out there is there just simply hasn't been the money um, made available to do that. And so how can, how can you make it, how can you make money for fish passage? And, and, and the opportunity here is to really to use um, uh, what is increasingly happening, including down there in California with um, power purchase agreements um, uh, to take that, potential additional generation of power and apply it to, let's say, uh, we put the whoosh fish passage system in and maybe maybe there's a habitat restoration element that has to happen up above stream too. So that those monies, it's not a it's not a loss to the uh, to the hydro operator and that so there there's one where there is already a ladder. And then if there is a situation where there there is no fish passage at all, uh, <laughs> um, uh, how can you take that economic um, loss, if you will, out of the equation for um, for everybody? Well, what what if what if what if you took enough um, power out of that uh, out of that particular reservoir to to pay for it? So what we're what we're really trying to do is uh, what if we brought project financing into fish passage so so you don't have to pay for this all up front you can pay for yeah. it over 20 years and and yeah, it's just, tied to some small power purchase agreement i'm just kind of torn a bit on on this and i think it gets down to how i classify a uh, you know a dam in my in my mind in terms of what it what its purpose is um mm -hmm. again if it's like being used for flood control or water storage right um that's that's one thing i think that you know the dam's necessary but as we're seeing, there's a lot of there's a lot of dams in our area that that don't fit that bill, and they're really just for hydropower. A lot of them, um, they're ending their end of life. In turn, you know, we have one locally here that the PG&E um, is like, you know, they're scratching their heads. They're they're like, are we going to re up the license on this thing? Because these are long, you know, multi multi decade licenses, um, right? Or because it, it's it's like a you know, it's either they're break even right now, or they might even be losing money on it. Um, for example, so they're like, okay, well, screw it. We're just gonna, we're we're not gonna relicense it. Nobody else is gonna take it. Um, you know, PG's on, PG and is on the hook to pull it down. Um, so maybe it gets pulled down at some point. Now, the the case I'm using is a little more little more complex. There's than no that. fish passage involved, right? But let's just say there was, mm -hmm. right? Um, in those situations, like I think that you know. The, I would want to put a time constraint around a whoosh system involved because I'd want to ultimately see that that dam come down so that there's this downstream yeah. ecological uh, positive that happens. Um, yeah. So that's that's kind of like where I'm torn. I I understand what you're saying. I just wouldn't be politically behind backing anything that was going to you know basically extend the life of a dam that in my mind uh there's better technology for it's a, it's a gap you know i look at hydropower as a gap technology well I, I and i understand exactly what you're saying and i and i i think what uh we're i'm arguing from the standpoint here of is uh we we've got a limited amount of time in many of these places right. to help the fish <laughs> and yeah. or they're just not going to be there. And, I, and that so, I fully agree with you on. And, so, and we've talked a lot about these fish getting up, but what about getting back? Yeah. We haven't, we haven't well, that, that's, talked about I mean, much of that. If it's salmon, I mean, it's just smolts. We got to, they're, I guess the concern is right. That's right. We are all, we're always asked about that. Um, do, you and I can, the, do you have this? Are you going to announce the the salmon machine gun? <laughs> you know? it shoots fifty cal smolt bullets. Yeah, well, we, we're going to think more carefully about our our naming conventions going forward. But no, you know, we we do try to have fun with the names of the various uh, products that we've got. Um, uh, you know, we've got a product for, for uh, Elver, which is a, a, a juvenile eel, um, and we call it the Elverator, for example. <laughs> That's pretty but, cool. <laughs> but, 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 uh, but uh, you know, the, the downstream side of things um, is, 
there's a lot of attention and there's a lot of focus and a lot of money going to it. And uh, uh, we, when we started, we actually held a charrette and had um, uh, folks from uh, all the agencies and a lot of experts and so forth. And, and we asked a simple question. If you were to start, where do you start, upstream or downstream? And even then, there was a lot of, uh, 10 years ago, there was a lot of talk about the downstream side of things, and, and there was an assumption that the upstream with ladders had, had solved the problem. Uh, at least that's, that's the public narrative out there. Um, uh, but what came out of that charrette was that we definitely had to start with the upstream. Hmm. And, um, and, that's, and, the, and the, the, the reason is actually pretty logical, um, and it, it gets back to... The more spawning uh, ground. A, it, it, well, you, if you have more fish, uh, yes, upstream, so certainly. I, it, it, it has to do with the number of um, eggs that are being carried in these adult fish. And, and the, if you want to have an, an impact on the number of um, juveniles heading downstream, um, the, the easiest way, the, the, the way you can have an impact the fastest is by getting more of the adults to successfully spawn. So um, one of the things that uh, uh, we know um, today is that uh, a lot of the fish, they may get over a dam, but then they, they, there's pre-spawning mortality. And and uh, so they don't ever <laughs> make that long journey almost all the way, um, but don't get the job done, so to speak. So... Um, been there myself. Yeah, yeah, and so and the and the rules are sort of set up where a, a fry or a smolt is valued um, the same way as an adult, but that's in if you were to talk to the aquaculture industry, aquaculture industry, they would be laughing at that um, uh, because uh, they, you know, an egg you can buy for. Um, uh, just a couple of pennies that will turn into a fry, um, or. or um, uh, an adult um, fish may may cost fifteen hundred dollars or more. That's ready to spawn. Right, right. A and uh, that process, uh, you know, or that kind of thinking doesn't really um, it doesn't really come into the the thinking most of the time when we're dealing with the, the, the natural fish. But but if you if you if you put it in those terms for a second, um, you, you understand why the aquaculture industry is doing that and how how come. Know that why they use the whoosh system to move their fish. So the uh, the reality of it is is that uh, if, if we look at the numbers, um, let's assume if there's five thousand eggs in a fish, the the adult is is uh, at least five thousand times more valuable than one fry, just just based on on that. But it ends up being far more than that actually, because um, only a percentage of those adults uh, right. ever make it back, and so, so if you're if you're if you do the math, and we've done the math, and uh, uh, as to how to look at this, and, and you want to affect a return that's that's faster, um, you you need that you need that to happen. Um, you need the adults to to get up, and and right now, um, there there is success getting past a ladder, but the uh, success of getting to the actual spawning grounds and sp successfully spawning is much less. Yeah, it makes so, sense. So that's, that's, we've got to address that. And then the other part of it is that, um, uh, you know, our rivers have filled up with non-native species, um, often predators to the juveniles. And that's where we also think um, uh, with the scanning systems, to be able to remove the invasive species that are moving between these waterways, and that, and this is where the the barriers that are out there can actually be helpful here in cleaning up, cleaning things up, <laughs> if you will, um, that are of what's happening in the river. Um, in Washington State, for example, um, smallmouth bass, a great sport fishing fish, um, but they are not native to the Columbia River. Um, uh, are just you know, they devour the uh, and we're doing uh, effectively nothing about that today uh, the uh, the uh, sh American shad which uh, has come into the rivers is uh, in in the Columbia River they 
they outnumber all the salmonids uh, coming into the river by far now wow. um, every year. And uh, while they may not be um, chowing down on the juveniles, that the habitat that the juveniles use to protect themselves as they're coming downstream is being um, impacted in a way that's not helpful to the to the juveniles to to, to hide from other predators and so forth. So, so to to us, um, you know, hey, well, you can put you can you can uh, address these very obvious problems, um, and and have a dramatic impact on the. the the uh, the waterway uh, and the ability of the native fish to to really have a, a fair chance and so um, but we've never been able to do that before uh, you know and that's that's what's uh, that t- to us is what's so exciting about this is let's uh, let's let's let this happen um, are, are you guys talking about using eDNA for any of the for selecting these fish uh, i know that there's some stuff being done uh and traps to to try to trap some of these invasive species using e e and e dna is that something you guys have talked about or uh no because i'm not sure i know what you're speaking of right now oh, okay uh, it's basically uh, <laughs> it's it's a technology that uh finds genetic markers in in upstream water and then they can basically get a uh, you know they have a matrix of of known known genetic uh, DNA strands and they basically just say it's a yes or no if that species is present in the system up above where they did the sample. Oh, okay. Um, uh, we, we are not using that to make a sorting decision if that's if, you right. know, in, in that in that, in that had, manner. Had um, lab and do much stuff, so. Right. It's a, it's a four day process um, so, at least. <laughs> so, so th- but um, that doesn't mean that uh, uh, we can't get there. Um, one of our biologists on board is uh, uh, a uh, microimmunologist um, and who's developed vaccines uh, for humans. Um, in fact, Gardasil, which is for the human papillomavirus, was uh, her project. Um, and so we've asked a lot of these you know, kinds of questions. For example, um, if a fish is going through the tube um, and what and let's say we could identify that that fish um, that's in that's moving upstream is uh, diseased. Mm-hmm. That's just as an example. Mm-hmm. Um, well, we could we could um, redirect it to, to be treated uh, before it was left gone, or you could potentially you could potentially tr- treat the fish in the tube, uh, depending upon the. Or you may want to uh, just take it out of the brood stock and not perpetuate you may take its, it out. Gene, its gene. It, all, all of those things are are possible, and that's where yeah. the fisheries resource managers cool. will have these kinds of choices um, going forward. That, I'm not saying we're doing all that now, but <laughs> yeah. um, the, you can see where this can can lead. Um, and uh, you know, for those who uh, just uh, was, are we affecting um, in, in Darwin's uh, <laughs> theory here by by helping the fish at all? I don't know. I mean, I, I think. I think uh, well, clearly we're having an impact on that, but but we've already had the impact by the the barrier that we put into the river, so you know maybe uh, we're yeah. leveling the playing field. I want to do <laughs> so, I want to do a whole episode on genetic engineering, and we we will some someday because it's it's a really interesting point or it's a really interesting thing, especially with respect to fisheries management. Um, well, look, you we you did we, give yeah. us a hard stop at two. We're almost fifteen minutes over. Um, before we we cut you loose, is there anything we didn't ask you that we should have asked? I uh, no, probably not. You do, you guys covered things pretty well. I I would just say this that um, you know in order to uh, affect the kind of change and not keep doing exactly what we've been doing um, for the last eighty years, um, it really does have to come from the people and the and the fishermen to demand. Uh, better, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so you know what you guys are doing here. Uh, I think in in educating everybody, um, you know that's a big part of what why we're um, trying to be as uh, open and public as we can with, and uh, even have some fun with it on the social media. Is is that the politicians um, 
the politicians actually respond to that, as we've learned. <laughs> uh, and uh, so as the as uh, as we as the public and we as the fishermen out there who are um, uh, wanting to continue to enjoy this and enjoy this with our kids going forward, uh, you know, it's it's just critical I, um, that that happened. I, you know, your your kids are only going to go out so many times and not catch a fish and <laughs> and want to do it again. Um, so uh, I think that uh, we are at this point here uh, where we're really saying um, there, we haven't. You know, there's all this change going on. There's globalization. There's climate change, and there's technology. And the fish have been affected by the first two, and we, but we haven't brought any of the technology that could benefit them um, really to the table here. It, it's 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 time that we do that, and if we don't do it, you know, then it's just too late. So, so let's do it. <laughs> it's sad that it takes so long for some of those things to to get through the system, right? I mean, it, it, you're yeah. right. You're, it, everything you're saying, and we totally agree, and that's one of the main, and we're finding that. Uh, along with a lot of the episodes that we've been doing is that all these people are coming together at a time when it needs to happen now to make this change. So, um, yeah, I, I think the system's great. I know there's a lot of pushback, but, um, I, I think it's, I think it's fantastic because we have to do something different than we've been doing for the last 80 years. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it's, it, it, you know, it, it helps to have people helping along and we've had a lot of help along the way. And I think, uh, we've really had, done a a lot of work to try to do the uh the hard science behind it also to so that uh you know there there it it makes it a less risky decision for everybody that uh, this is this is the right thing to do it's not it's not that it's uh you're going out on a limb here it's it's absolutely what you should yeah. be doing well let's have let's have one of your project uh, managers back on the show here in in a little while yeah, and, I, and I, hear hear about uh, cuz i know this is new and i'm sure there's there's more to it and we'd like to hear some kind of on the ground stuff yeah and i, I want to know how the heck you guys go in and even give a price like, <laughs> how the hell do you even bid that there's so many different variables and um yeah so maybe another episode with one uh, someone else just to talk about that and and stuff Nick <laughs> that uh that that has been one of the trickier things but uh, it's I'm got sure. it, it, it gets easier over time yeah. uh, <laughs> like all things do yeah okay well thanks, well, thanks a lot so much yeah no thank yeah. you vince hey. um ceo of, wo- of whoosh whoosh Whoosh. whoosh innovations whoosh, thank there you for, it is. i know you're busy you got uh eighty five thousand dams to address and, and very little time so thank you for taking the time to talk to us today and and um yeah it, it was great thank you for thank you for your time appreciate it very much thank you take thanks, care thanks vance all right tight lines mm-hmm. everybody Bye-bye. well i'm not gonna hit i'm not gonna hit a stop yet if you yeah. like this episode please leave us yeah here come here comes the, the pitch oh Vince hung up on us. <laughs> if you like this episode, other than Vince, um, <laughs> please leave us a, a review on uh, Google Play and iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. We're on Stitcher. We're on, uh, where else? We're on Spotify, all kinds of places. We're in every nook and corner, cranny, corner, whatever. Um, also, we have, a, uh, we have a Facebook group. It's private, um, invite only, so no one will spam you. We do have some good conversations in there with some pretty smart, smart folks in all parts of the industry. Uh, there's retail people in there. There are guides in there. There's guys like me and Nick in there, fellow anglers. There's biologists. There's entomologists. That's funny. There's I thought it was just you in there. Astronauts. Well, it may seem that way. <laughs> I, I post a lot, but um, yeah, I think we're like pushing 300 people in there now. Um, anytime you we we do any of our software releases or anything, we put the, sh- the notes in there, release notes, so you know what's what's going on. And if you guys have questions, feedback about the, any of the products and stuff we're working on, whether it be the podcast or whatever, um, that's where you would you can interact with us uh, pretty pretty easily. And also direct messages on Instagram. We get a lot of direct messages on Instagram from people, and we really appreciate all the feedback, advice, um, all that stuff you guys are are shooting us over the internets. Um, That's all I have for this episode. Thanks for joining us. Again, Cal Trout, props to you guys for supporting this show. Uh, We can pay that intern, uh, Manny over there, sitting there quietly in his headphones, doesn't know I'm talking shit. He hears you. Oh, he does. (laughs) Anyway. 
I, I, you want to just keep going? <laughs> I'm, I'm tired. Okay. Thanks for listening, you guys. Leave Tight lines now. Bye. Special thanks to our sponsors. Without them, this show would not be possible. And thanks for listening. If you have ideas or any questions for the show, send an email to bishon at barbless.co or join our Facebook group at facebook.com slash the barbless podcast and tap on the visit group link. Also, be sure to follow us on Instagram at barbless.co or find us on YouTube. Thanks for listening.